Welcome back, Lecture 9, Math 241. We left a problem on the table yesterday, so let's pick back up with that, and we'll be able to go into our next application of integration, which is volume. So uh, the thing that's going to carry over in just about every application in Chapter 6 is that we're going to break what it is that we're trying to find, area under a curve, area between two curves, volume, which we'll start on today. We're going to break it into pieces. We'll try to analyze uh, a description of one of those pieces, one of those little skinny little rectangles, one of those little slices of volume, whether it's a disc or a washer or whatever it is, cylindrical shell. We'll talk about the kind of generic description of that piece, and then we'll let integration add together an infinite number of those pieces for us. So remember what um, that funny looking integration S is related to. It's related to that other S, that sigma S, which is a summation of an infinite amount of things. So that's kind of how we're going to handle just about everything in chapter six as far as an application of integration. So we had a couple of parametric equations and we wanted the uh, area under that cycloid, one of the little loops of the cycloid. And we finished class yesterday with this uh, equation. This is related to um, f of x dx from a to b, which we use in finding area under a curve. And f of x is really the same as y. We've treated it that way to this point. And y in the parametric equation was defined as a function of t, excuse me, a function of theta. This was the, uh, what y was defined to be in terms of theta. Uh, f of x dx, well, dx, this is the derivative of what x was defined to be in terms of theta. And then we're going to be integrating with respect to theta. So these values are kind of starting and stopping values as far as theta is concerned. So it's the same format. It looks a little different. It looks significantly different, but it still is kind of f of x dx in the integrand. And our limits are in terms of theta now. So therefore, we'll be integrating with respect to theta. So we left with that. Anything that we can simplify by pulling out in front of that? What things have to stay to the right of the integral sign, and what things can we bring out front? Bring out the R, bring out the R times the R, so we can bring out an R squared. And once we do that, we have 1 minus cosine theta. We have two of those, so that thing times itself, d theta. So let's square that. Two of the three terms that we'll generate will be kind of easily integrable. The third we're going to have to mess with a little bit more. So we'll square 1 minus cosine theta. We'll get 1. The middle term ought to be twice their product. And the last term, which is a little bit of a stubborn term, is that last term squared, which would be cosine squared. So we've got r squared times the integral of 1 d theta. Gosh, I can do that one. Minus 2 integral of cosine theta d theta. I can do that one too. The last one is a little stubborn, but we've done this before. What did we do when we encountered either a sine squared or a cosine squared or a sine to the fourth, cosine to the sixth? We're stuck with an even power of sine or cosine. OK, so we had that double angle or half angle identity formula. So for cosine squared of theta, what are we going to replace it with? 
one plus two theta. Two theta. Yep. That work? Yes. Now let's suppose you forget that. How could we come up with that in forty five seconds or less? I'll be honest with you, at this very moment, I don't know that that's right. I mean, I trust the two people that gave me that, but if I had to come up with that on my own right now, I don't know that I could do that. So do you have a backup if the if the memory fails? Yes? Cosine of 2 theta equals cosine squared of theta minus sine squared theta. Okay, I would start with that. And then cosine of 2 theta... That's a double angle identity. Is that right? And if you have to go a step back from that, it'd actually be cosine of theta plus theta, right? Cosine theta, cosine theta, minus sine theta, sine theta. So anyway, you could get to that point. Well, we want the cosine squared, so I guess we want to keep this around, right? And we want to, we're stuck with this, but we can get rid of sine squared and replace it with what? One minus cosine squared? Yes. I guess I better hurry because I said 45 seconds or less, right? What's cosine squared minus a negative cosine squared? Two cosine squared? Minus one. So what's left? to do, to kind of validate that we're using the right double angle identity here. Okay, so we'd need to add one to both sides. And take half of each side. Does that work? I don't know if that's 45 seconds or less, but it's not too much to validate that we, in fact, have the correct substitution for cosine squared. Questions or issues with that? What if we wanted sine squared and you forget it? Do we, can we still use this? Mm -hmm. And replace, keep that and replace that, right? With one minus sine squared. How does it differ from this one? One minus, right? Still got a half out in front, one minus cosine of two theta. So if we replace that in there, let's go ahead and integrate the things that we can integrate. What's the integral of one d theta? Would be theta. What's the integral of cosine theta d theta? So you're really asking yourself, what has cosine for its derivative, right? Sine. Would be sine. And now for cosine squared, we're going to replace it with this double angle identity. I'll bring the one half out in front. All this is the same. Let's get to the new part. We're going to have a one half, and then we're going to be integrating once again one d theta. What's that? Theta. Theta again. And we're going to be integrating cosine two theta d theta. Let u equal two theta. We need a what? Two in the integrand. Yes. Correct for it with a half out front. One half, we've already got the other one half, so sine, sine two theta. So we've got everything at least either integrated, uh, well, everything's integrated now. This is done. All we have to do is evaluate. This is done. Evaluate from zero to two pi. And now we've integrated each piece of this, so we could also evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. So, and that's kind of typical, I guess, with a um, x in terms of theta and y in terms of theta. 
that you're going to get stuck with something that requires this kind of substitution. So we're kind of stuck with a cosine squared, but we've handled that before. We just kind of have to dig back into what we substituted for that previously. Anybody question kind of how to get to an answer from this point? Everybody feel confident? You could plug in 0 and 2 pi and subtract and get a solution. And that would be the area under one of the loops of the cycloid. Um, I usually don't talk on my cell phone when I come from my office to here. And like yesterday, it was really pretty and all the snows on the ground. Kind of contemplate different things. Um, I, I talk enough. I don't need to talk additionally on the cell phone. Um, sometimes I get a call. I, I urge you to do that, by the way, is to to kind of have some contemplation time rather than get out of class and, you know, start dialing everybody and where are you going, what's for lunch, you know. Uh, it's constant chatter, okay. That's kind of what the world is like right now a little bit, but just deny that sometimes. Just leave, I, my cell phone's off right now. Sometimes I just leave it off, and it's just wonderful. Uh, so when I walk places, I get to look at nature and snow and, you know, it's just, it's just beautiful. I urge you to do that, to, to turn the cell phone off. Um, but I was doing that contemplation thing. You've already heard that before, haven't you, Nicole and Chandler and Kelly and Katie? Okay, so I'm sorry you had to hear it again. Um, but I was contemplating the fact that um, I didn't think I did a great job of the diagram yesterday of the cycloid. So let's address this once again and see if I can kind of fill in. So we've got this circle, circular something that's here. We're putting a dot on it and we're going to roll it along the desktop, this line, the x-axis. And as we roll this circle along, this thing tracks out what amounts to a cycloid. And when we've rolled it along so that the circle is right back where we started, the dot on the circle is right back here, this is what I felt like I didn't do an adequate job of. Now we said to simplify things that the radius would be one. That helps, but it doesn't have to be one. Um, if we've rolled this thing along and we've tracked the position of that dot and it now is right back where it started, we said that was 2 pi, but in reality it's only 2 pi if the radius is 1. But isn't that distance from here to here the circumference of that circle? Is that correct? So as you roll it out and the dot is right back where it started, this ought to be the circumference. and if the radius is 1, the circumference is 2 pi. Probably didn't do a good job with that yesterday, so let's, let me try to clean that up today. If it's not 1, what is the circumference? 2 pi times the radius. So if the radius is 1, it is 2 pi. Well, we plotted a point yesterday, and I kind of had to backtrack because I had already said that this was pi, and this was 2 pi. Well, that's only true when the radius is 1. If the radius is just open-ended and it's r, then we would say this would be 2 pi r and this would be pi r, right? So I think we ended up with a point that we were trying to plot that was, in fact, pi r. And I said, let's make r equal to 1 just to make it fit the diagram. But if r is not 1, this thing still works. You won't be integrating from 0 to 2 pi you'd be integrating from 0 to 2 pi r. And if you want to do it in terms of r, that's fine. You could have a final answer in terms of r. But we did the problem where r was 1, so this was pi and this was 2 pi. But it can be done, let r just be r, some open-ended number. See what weird things I contemplate when I walk from here to Harrelson. But I, I knew that I had not done justice to that yesterday. Um, let's go into 6.2. So remember the skinny little rectangle concept? 
we want an infinite number of those added together. We do that not by this summation, but remember as we have an infinite number of these skinny little things that we're adding together, that s, that Greek sigma, becomes this s, the integration. So we are able to add an infinite number of these things together as long as we describe them right here. So if we describe one of them and we tell it where to start and where to end, then we're in business. We've added an infinite number of those things together. So in 6.2, we're going to take, um, I guess, three distinctly different looks at volume. And we're going to slice it up. Uh, these are volumes of uh, solids of revolution. So we're going to have a figure in the plane. We're going to rotate it around some axis, either the x-axis or the y-axis, or a line that's parallel to the x or y axes. And we're going to generate some three-dimensional figure, and we're going to use this concept of getting skinny little pieces or slices of it and add them all together using integral calculus. So it is an application of integration. Um, this is probably way overly simplified, but let's say we have some f of x in the plane. And we start and stop the region bounded by f of x with some vertical line x equals a and x equals b. So we start and stop it just like we did with the area. And we want that region that's bounded by this vertical line, this vertical line, the curve itself, and the x-axis and we want to revolve that around the x-axis. So here is our axis of revolution. So this, I'm not going to be good at this, but I have some pictures that are better than mine. And you have uh, shaded pictures in your book uh, in section 6.2, much better than what I'm going to come up with here. But if you can envision taking that region, holding this fixed, right here as an axis of revolution, spinning that around the x-axis, you'll come up with a three-dimensional solid. And it looks something like that. Okay, And I'll show a picture that's better than this. So you can envision this solid 3D figure. Our job is to, first of all, create the pieces that we can describe one of them. It represents all of them. And then we integrate it. By, and that adds together an infinite number of these skinny little pieces or slices together from where we tell it to start to where we tell it to stop. So one of these slices, much thicker than we actually want it to be, we really want it to be a, as thin as we could possibly make them. Stack them all side to side, and we have all the volume that we want from x equals a to x equals b. But there's one of the slices. Now, how do we form the slices? So we're going to slice it up perpendicular. to the axis of revolution. So our axis of revolution is the x-axis. So we form our slices this way, chopping it up perpendicular to the axis of revolution. We need to describe how much volume there is in this slice and hoping that all the slices, and you may actually want to draw several of them to see that if we describe one of them in that fashion, are they all really described by that same description? 
So here's our slice. Actually, let's position it a little differently. That slice on its edge looks like this. All of them do. So what's the volume of something that looks like this? What is it, first of all? That's a cylinder, right? Little, short, squatty little cylinder. What's the volume of a cylinder? Pi r squared h. Now, if you know that, then you can do any of these volume problems. If you know that the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h, then you're going to be able to do this. That'll kind of start you. Now, you can memorize other formulas if you want to, but this is the one that will kind of, as you want to go all the way back to the volume of a cylinder, that will get you started. So we need to be able to describe the radius of each slice that we generate, which is a little disk, a solid disk in this case. Everybody agree that those are solid? If we take that region, spin it around the x-axis, we don't have anything hollow in the middle. It's a solid disk. Uh, here's a better picture. This one at the bottom is what we're dealing with. I'm trying some different colors. I, I really have a problem with light blue, so I'm trying some different colors, uh, even though that we are kind of have a stack of light blue paper up here. Not my favorite color. So we've got this function. We take the region. We, they've divided theirs up into skinny little rectangles. That's fine. But when we revolve that around the x-axis, we slice it up perpendicular to the axis of revolution, and we get a bunch of disks, solid disks. So that's what we're dealing with. Now, how skinny do we want them to be? A whole lot skinnier than this picture. Paper thin, in fact, even skinnier than paper thin, we want our thickness to approach zero. So what is the thickness? What would we say that is? That's that's a delta x on this picture. We want the thickness, which is the height, really, isn't it, of each little short squatty cylinder. We want that to diminish to practically zero. When we allow that to happen, then we have zero error. We get the exact volume of this figure. Now, that's if we're going around the x-axis, where the x-axis is the axis of revolution. We might take a curve and say the y-axis is the axis of revolution. So we take this region, bounded, y equals some initial value, y equals some terminal value. Spin that around the y-axis, we get a figure that looks like this. Since we're going around the y-axis, we chop it up perpendicular to the axis of revolution, and that creates solid disks in this fashion. So these are really the same. If we can describe one of the um, disks, in this case a solid disk, we'll use integral calculus to add them all together from beginning y value to ending y value. So up here, again, we want the thickness to approach zero. Well, what is the thickness up here? It's a delta y. So we're going to have dy's in our integrand. And we're going to be integrating from y something, y0 to y1. Down here, we're going to have a dx in the integrand. And we're going to be integrating from x0 to xn. But it's the same process. Now, that's if we use one of the two axes as the axis of revolution. And we might use a line that's parallel to them. Uh, and we'll hopefully have enough time to look at an example I don't know, not looking good. But at some point in time, maybe not today, we'll get to that example as well. So each piece is a solid disk. And we want to find the volume. All right, first example. Pictures help. Pictures aren't absolutely necessary. But pictures, I think, are going to help you to decide if do we have a solid disk. Well, that's all we have at this point, so that's what the first example is going to be. 
but the next example is not going to be a solid disk. We'll have to analyze how we find its volume. So let's take, let's make it pretty simple. And I've got a better picture of this. So we're not just going to depend on my picture. Uh, let's take the region bounded by y equals x squared. x equals negative 1. x equals 1. And the x-axis. And we're going to take that region and we're going to spin it around the x-axis. <laughs> so we'll have this three-dimensional solid. So y equals x squared plus 1. Looks like this negative 1 to 1. So there's the region that we're going to spin around the x-axis. So I think it helps to get that symmetric image. Again, it, whether that helps give it a three-dimensional feel, I don't know, but it helps me kind of decide what I'm dealing with. So I'll try to Give this a little three-dimensional feel. And I want to chop it up, slice it up perpendicular to the axis of revolution. So there's a representative piece or slice. So if we take that bounded region, spin it around the x-axis, can you visualize the three-dimensional solid that we have? Does that slice or that piece seem to represent any other slice or piece that I could draw. So if we can describe what the volume of this one is, all of them are pretty much the same, right? Do they all have, as we start at the axis of revolution and go out to generate the radius, that's the radius, right? Would all of them have that same line segment as their radius? Not that same one, but could we describe it in such a way that it represents the radius of every disk. I think we can. So from the x-axis up to a point on the curve, that's going to be the radius. So we're going to, I said that that would get you started. It can get you started. That's the volume of one of these little disks, one of these little cylinders. But we're going to need to know what the radius is. How would you describe coming from the x-axis up to a point on the curve. What is that, typically? That's f of x. That's how we plot the point, right? We put it into the function. We go over that many units, x units, but we go up f of x units. So the radius seems to be y or f of x. What about the height or thickness? What's the thickness of this particular slice or disk? It's going to be an increment of x, right? Some little small distance in terms of x. That's created by how we chopped it up. So it's going to be a delta x, or I guess a little further down the road, it's going to be a dx in the integrand. I've got a better picture of this because mine is not all that good. So here's a better picture of what we're dealing with. Here's our curve, y equal x squared plus 1. Uh, stopping at 1, starting at negative 1. It's a solid, three-dimensional solid. And one of the slices or disks is pictured here. So we need the radius. Now they have this described as w sub i squared plus 1. Wherever we are, w sub i, we would put that into the function, right? That's just telling you that that distance is the f of whatever the x value we're plugging in. So if it's w sub i, we'd plug it into this function. 
and we'd get W sub I squared plus 1. So better figure, but we don't have to be quite so uh, subscripted that we, you know, put in all of the subscripted values. We'll describe one of them. We know what integral calculus does. It adds them all up for us. So pi is number. We'll just bring it out front. Where are we starting these little pieces or slices? Negative 1. And that is an x value, and aren't we going to be integrating with respect to x? We are, because we're going to have a dx in the integrand. And we're going to stop it at 1. That's where to start and stop the skinny little disks. Pi is already taken care of. We want the radius squared. What is the radius? It's the y value. And what is the y value for this particular function? x squared plus 1. So that's our radius squared. And our height of each disk is an increment of x, a little delta x, which in the integrand for us becomes a dx. So there's the integral calculus problem. That will get us the volume of this three-dimensional region. Questions about getting to that point? So that'll get you started. Pi r squared h, volume of a cylinder. If you want to memorize more beyond that, then that's completely up to you. But that, that should work. So we've got to square this, x squared plus 1. Well, let's, maybe if we don't have to. Let's not square it if we don't have to. Can we use a u substitution? Yes. Can we let u equal x squared plus 1? Yes. We could try. I don't think it's going to work. Why is it not going to work? Because we don't have another x in the integrand. We need another x for du, right? We can't manufacture variable quantities inside the integrand. That would kind of, we could change any problem we wanted to if we could do that. So we are forced to square it. First term squared, twice their product. Last term squared. It's not going to be bad. So we're going to integrate x to the fourth dx, x to the fifth over 5, integrate 2x squared with respect to x, 2 thirds x cubed, correct me if I'm wrong now, and integrate 1 with respect to x, I think I can handle that one, negative 1 to 1. So we're going to have one fifth plus two thirds plus one. And what? All the negatives stay negative, right? Everything's odd. So negative one fifth minus two thirds minus one. Everybody feel confident you can put all that together. Right, we're going to have two fifths plus four thirds plus two. Add that together, multiply it by pi. That's the number of cubic units of volume, right? That's the volume of a three dimensional region. Questions about that? Integration is not going to be the hard part. I mean, occasionally we'll have to do some testy little double angle identity or something like that that we've already done before. But when you get to that point, you're three-fourths of the way there. Questions before that one gets moved? What would change if we took a similar shaped region and wrapped it around the y-axis instead of the x-axis? our thickness or height would be delta y. We'd be going from a y value, some initial y value, to some terminal y value. Basically, nothing changes, right? You just reference all your disks on how they're related, how the radius is related to the y-axis instead of the x-axis. OK. 
Okay, let's try this picture and see how we think the region is going to be different from what we've looked at so far in terms of a solid disk. We want to take the region bounded by these curves. This is kind of a bizarre way to give you the equation, but I'm giving it to you the way it was written. I don't think this is a problem in this book. I think I got it out of another source. So we've got a parabola and a line. Two vertical lines. And we want to take this region. We're going to do two problems with this diagram. We'll redraw the diagram. Uh, the first time, let's go around the x-axis. So kind of looks like it's going to be the same type problem. It's actually going to be very different. So if we solve this for y, this would be y equals x squared plus 2, very similar to what we had. Now we've got a another line. If we solved that for 2y, 2y would be x plus 2, and therefore y would be 1 half x plus 1. Is that right? I think that's right. So y equals x squared plus 2. And I'm going to start at x equals 0, so I don't need the other part of that. So I want to start at x equals 0, stop at x equals 1. And the other one is this line, y equals 1 half x plus 1, so the y-intercept is 1, and the slope is 1 half. So there's our region that's bounded by the parabola, the line, and the two vertical lines, x equals 0 and x equals 1. So we want to go around the x-axis. A little different, isn't it? What's the, what's the result that's going to be different? Why is this a different problem? It's not, it's like bounded, by the yeah. it's not what? Bounded by the x-axis. Okay, we don't have the region all the way down to the x-axis like we did before or in the reverse situation, we don't have it all the way over to the y-axis. So when we take this, and we spin it around the x-axis, I'm not going to clutter it too much, but I, this is going to probably clutter it. What about that disk? Once we take that region, spin it around the x-axis, it's missing some volume, right, out of the middle. So the disk is not a solid disk, but a, depending on the part of the country you're from, it's either a washer or a washer, okay? Uh, I grew up where this was a washer, but I've adapted and now I call it a washer, okay? But it's one of those two. It's something that looks like this. A donut or a bagel, okay? We'll go with that too. But it's kind of a flat one. But all those conjure up the idea that there's something missing right in the middle. So this is not a solid disk, it's a washer. So we're not going to be able to start with pi r squared h because that's a solid disk. So we need to come up with what the volume of a washer would be. So a washer is really the entire solid disk minus the part that's missing out of the middle, right? 
So if we want to come up with something like this, we'll start out with the entire solid disk and we'll subtract out the volume that's missing. So we're going to have two radii here, so let's call one capital R and the other one lowercase r. So what, how much volume is there in the larger solid disk? Pi capital R squared H, does that work? And the other one has a lowercase r, pi r squared H. So we'll kind of approach this from what we have done, which is um, very Ossobellian. If you want to want to know what that is, look up David Ossobell, is a uh, psychologist, and that was his method of cognition. Is the way we're doing this right here. I'm an Ossobellian learner myself. Look it up; you might be as well. So, if we want to come up with the volume of this, can't we take this guy and subtract this from it? What do they have in common that we could factor out from? And H. Or, let me put the H at the end because the H is going to be a DX or a DY, right? So we usually have that at the end of the integrand. Capital R we can call the outer radius. In this lowercase r, we can call the inner radius. There's the volume of a washer. Does that work? Now, don't take outer radius minus inner radius and then square the result. That's not what we have. It's the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared. So that's our volume. That's our description of a washer, regardless of where that washer is located, which, how it's positioned in the plane. If we slice up our three-dimensional region and each slice is not a solid disk but rather a washer, then we're going to come back to, to this thing right here. Um, here's a better picture. I said I would come up with a better picture. So if we have some region, we've revolved it around the x-axis, and we have something like this, and the dotted lines show you the part of the volume that's actually missing in there, and you slice it up perpendicular to the axis of revolution, you're going to get one of these. Does that work? And we just need to make sure we don't count the volume that's in here. So we do that by taking the outer radius, subtracting the inner radius from it. And in this case, our thickness or height is delta x, right? And this would be from, it looks like on this diagram, from A to B. So that's what one of our slices is going to be. We describe one of the slices. What does the little elongated S do, it adds together an infinite number of these skinny little slices for us. Chandler, you had a question? Yeah, I guess I set it up differently, and it's, I think I just did it wrong. Never mind. It's okay. Is that right? Yeah. Can you see that slice? So, I mean, my figure, I didn't kind of draw the three-dimensional version because it's going to get cluttered in a hurry, and you're going to see that you're going to lose the fact that this is missing some volume out of the middle. So you might just want to kind of visualize what that looks like and then picture one of your slices. So we had these curves, y equal x squared plus 2, and y equal 1 half x plus 1. So I'm going to refer back to this diagram. Sorry, it's going to get kind of cluttered. We're going to need the outer radius. Well, the outer radius comes from the axis of revolution, which is right here. 
So from here all the way out to this curve, describe to me what that distance is. Isn't that the y value of every point on this curve, right? So the outer radius is really y on the parabola, and what is y on the parabola? x squared plus 2. So our outer radius is the y value on the, I'll just put a sub p, y value on the parabola, which is x squared plus 2. So that's our capital R. Our lowercase r, it's going to get cluttered. I'm already overlapping. What's this distance from the x-axis up to here, which is really the inner radius? That's the y value on the line. That's right. And the y value on the line is 1 half x plus 1, right? So we'll farm the pi out to the front. Uh, we're starting, we're going to integrate with respect to x, so we're going to start this at 0 and end at 1. Capital R was x squared plus 2. That's the outer radius. We're going to square that. We're going to subtract from that the square of the inner radius. Inner radius was the y value on the line. So that's capital R squared minus lowercase r squared. And what's the height or thickness? dx, delta x. So again, when we get to this point, we're probably two-thirds to three-fourths of the way done with the problem. And this should be kind of old stuff. Let's see what it looks like. Any questions before we go just a little bit further? So we'll square that. x to the fourth plus 4 x squared plus 4. We'll square 1 half x. 1 fourth x squared. The middle term would be twice their product. What's the middle term? x. So we're going to have an x to the fourth. Um, how many x squared? 3 and a half? 7 halves? x squared? Does that work? Oh, sorry. 3.75. Where did I get 7 halves? All right, so what do we have there? 15 fourths. That's why you need to check my arithmetic. Thank you. So we got 4x squared minus a fourth x squared. 15 fourths x squared. Uh, we've got a what? Minus x and a plus 3. Everybody feel confident you can integrate each of those separate terms. If you, once you're done integrating, what are you going to get when you plug in 0? Everything's going to have an x in it, right? So those will all be 0. So you're going to get whatever you get when you plug in 1, right? So again, the integration is not going to be the difficult part. It's the, the setup. Identifying capital R, identifying little r, outer radius, inner radius, um, that should be the volume of this region, which has part of the volume missing out of the inside. Each slice is a washer. All right, we're out of time. We're going to take this same problem, and this next time go around a line that's parallel to the x-axis instead and see how that changes things. I will see you tomorrow.